All right. So shall we start? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. First question. Tell us about your involvement in rethinking your grading practices. All right. Um, so I guess for me, it began individually. Like I, uh, um, I guess I can recap some of what I said in the other meeting. I think, right? yeah, I think that would be helpful. That. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, um, Back in, I guess, 2013, 14, around that time, maybe a little bit later, um, we had a, we we used to have annual themes at Allegheny and we had a year of civil oh. rights and um, year of civil rights and year of voting rights, I think, were there were a couple in a row that were sort of s similar and because mm -hmm. it, it was around the time of the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act and that kind of thing. Okay. And so I was asked to participate and we had what were called gator groups because we're the Allegheny Gators. Um, okay. <laughs> where you would have a, have a group of students was like a little independent study and you would go to the events together and then discuss them afterwards. And okay. I got very unprepared for that, but um, decided to try it. <laughs> Um, very courageous <laughs> especially as a non-citizen and a mathematician it's like, that's not my wheelhouse but, um uh but that really opened my eyes really I learned so much um what did those... they share in particular well, there was just I, it was the first time I started I was introduced to like systemic racism and mm -hmm. a lot of the history like I had read independently civil rights things um mm -hmm. uh, actually to prepare to move to the states I read Martin Luther King's biography and Malcolm X's biography yeah. and I was like this was the things I could think of to do um but it was very minimal and so mm -hmm. it started me thinking what's what am I doing in my classes without realizing um like what right. a, what damage am I doing by using traditional methods basically in my mathematics classes and so I started to look into that and start thinking about how I could teach differently I was very much um you know, lecture focused and traditional grading systems. Mm -hmm. um, and I came across, I started initially thinking about flipped classrooms. Well, I, mm -hmm. it was early on, I was doing flipped classrooms and I came across one of Robert Talbot's classes. Mm -hmm. He kind of had mm -hmm. the whole class laid out, all the materials online for the course I was about to teach. And oh, so perfect. I decided, yeah, so I thought, well, <laughs> let me try this and see how it goes. Mm -hmm. And he happened to be using standards-based grading. And so- okay. I had never heard of anything like that before. I never realized there were other ways to grade. Um, Actually, can you say something about what, what you mean by standards based grading? Just yeah, sure. Um, so he was, if I can remember correctly, he had um, different objectives that were being, uh, so content objectives uh, mm -hmm. that were graded using multiple assessments, so mastery based okay. testing. Mm -hmm. And then I think for, it's hard for me to remember now, especially when mm -hmm. since I've sort of tweaked it so many times. But I sure. think he, I'm guessing he probably had for each grade level, um, you have to mm -hmm. complete this many tasks up to this level. And um, okay. so it was kind of laid out like that. So sort but of it, like a proficiency measurement uh, yeah. sort of an explanation of what different proficiency levels would mean. Yeah. And actually the phrase that sticks out to me, because I've used it in my own syllabi, he, the way he describes it is that students grades will be assigned based on the quantity and quality of the work that they submit so it's kind of both things so mm -hmm. interesting um, yeah having to submit a certain number of assignments but mm -hmm. also using specifications to grade individuals certain assignments that are a little bit more high level and so right um, and that's kind of the strategy I've, I've continued to use as the sort of quality and quantity um with so that's with, interesting. With, so, oops, I think I turned off my sound. Uh, it's interesting <laughs> that I was trying to turn off the dings um, because there's an argument constantly about whether you still motivate students if you're only focused on how much they've learned. And so that sounds like you're uh -huh. squaring that circle by acknowledging that somebody to learn has to put in a certain amount of work. <laughs> content yeah. yeah and then there's the measurement of how much they've learned um, yeah that's right okay. yep I um like yeah and so I I taught the course using his approach and I emailed him around that time and kind of got some good feedback from him and it was mm -hmm. awesome it was um just the the way that it changes how your class feels like it's not not no longer 
I'm the person with like the power to deduct points and <laughs> give you <laughs> partial <laughs> credit. And, yeah, like yeah. and it's really unclear, like, you know, if students know they have to get, you know, uh, a 90% or higher to get an A or, or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. It's not so clear what that actually means in practice. And then all right. the issues around um, what does an A actually represent and, and that kind of thing. So it just changed the way I thought about my classes. And mm -hmm. I started trying, um, after that, I integrated some mastery-based testing into my calculus. And then I was on sabbatical for a year. And mm -hmm. um, at that point decided that my sabbat one of my sabbatical projects was to redo our pre-calculus and calculus one courses like if I was based on everything I've been reading about mm -hmm. how students learn and um uh equity and uh in the alternative grading everything like that I was also mm -hmm. getting into inquiry-based learning at that time sure. so I went to during my sabbatical I went to an IBL uh workshop um so how just thinking about how would I kind of create the courses from the ground up using everything that I'd that I'd learned um, and so that was my project and then since then th I think they gave me kind of a strategy for transforming my courses and so now every time I teach a new course I go back and sort of do the same go through the same process and and rebuild it um, so, using so do you um, do you imagine that there's almost like a template or a, it sounds like you have a, a ritual that you go through yeah. when you start to convert a class? Um, yeah. Do you think that's something that's transferable that another person could absorb in some way from you? I think so. Yeah, I know if I've I've run some workshops where I've tried to convey it. I think I'm working on I'm giving a workshop at Spelman College in January there where I'm trying to sort of lay that out a little bit more. Um, even oh, very more precisely, yeah, yeah. Um, because it's part of a an an NSF grant that they have to convert a pre calculus course okay. um, with my Great. my help, sort of, so kind of completely doing doing the same thing, I guess. Um, now, is it still yeah. all related to flipped classroom, or do you see it as two pieces? Yeah, it's actually I've moved away from flipped classrooms and more into inquiry based learning. So, okay. so that was actually the piece that I didn't keep. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, what I do now is um, typically for my classes, I write sometimes with using other people's work as a starting plat point. I write a workbook of problems, and so mm -hmm. that it doesn't have a whole lot of content. It has some definitions and maybe a few examples, and then mm -hmm. a bunch of what I've call inquiries um, and so mm -hmm. the students work ahead on a certain um, up to a certain point so I tell them like what things to work on for the next class mm -hmm. and then um, they come to class and I get volunteers to present each of the problems and then we discuss them as a class and so that's how we progress through oh, the wow. content now so and I might do a mini lecture here and there but I I try to stay away from lecturing um, the bulk of the time yeah so are they are they also supplementing with a textbook as well as they do those assignments or they're really just learning it through doing those active activities yeah the idea is to write the workbook so that there's enough um that they can kind of use their prior knowledge and then you give them a little bit more so they can progress to kind of building up the mm -hmm. content yeah and you've so, done this for pre-calculus what other classes have you done this in uh, yeah, so pre-calculus, calculus, um, differential equations, introduction to analysis, uh, introduction to proof. Uh, what else have I taught recently? I'd love to see the introduction to proof one. I teach that all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. And actually, I, um, I'm going to be using, I'm teaching that in the spring. And I okay. decided to use um, Dana, what's his last name? There's a IBL guy who um, oh. Dana Ernst. Uh, he okay. he's actually written his own workbook, and I discovered oh, okay. it last time I was teaching the Intro to Proof course. And he's since published it through the MAA AMS, but he published it. Um, he also makes it available as open source, so he has okay. a special agreement. So um, you can you can just get the PDF. And I it, when I looked at it, it was kind of the workbook I wish I'd written. <laughs> and so. <laughs> So then I, I'm afraid because I already wrote my own workbook. What if it's not the workbook that I would have written? Yeah. It's better. Yeah. <laughs> well, he that would be good. Yeah, I just like the way that um, 
so my my workbooks are pretty sparse but he kind of filters out with a lot of like he has a nice introduction and then he has at the start of each chapter uh, uh, a little a quote and like an, a quote that sort of is connected yeah. to like growth mindset or the value of uh, making oh mistakes and yeah so it's just like it's oh so, that's wonderful it, yeah so I'm going to be using that now so mostly I write my own but that Mm-hmm. that one I decided his was his was better so I'm just going to go with that <laughs> and it was oh, free that's, yeah, yeah that's critical nowadays yeah um, so, okay um so I, and I'm hearing that there's a lot of connection or alignment between how you teach and how you grade can you yeah. talk a little bit more about the connection I remember that you also talked about the alignment between the purpose of what you're grading and how you're going to grade it but this is maybe a bigger lens where it's like how yeah. you grade it is influencing or being influenced by how you teach. Yeah, I think I think the biggest transformation for me was realizing, like, I mean, I I came through the math community where math, you know, the intro math courses were the gatekeeper courses and the weeding out courses. And so that was kind of built into my mentality. I think I, I think I've kind of had this sort of me versus them mentality when I was teaching and right. the transformation biggest transformation I think for me is realizing or feeling like I'm there to help them all of my students to be successful and so mm-hmm. I kind of view myself more as their coach as opposed to their professor and so mm-hmm. everything I try to design with that in mind and so um so starting with um like what are my goals for the course because previously and this uh, maybe this will sound familiar to you like my my strategy was you pick a textbook you figure out which chapters you're going to cover you count up how many sections that is you divide that across the number of days and then you go in and lecture about those and give a few exams and problem sets that was my old approach sure and um now it's like okay what is this course what do I want students to get by the end of this course um, both in terms of content, but also in terms of mathematical skills, like maybe around writing, understanding mm-hmm. the conventions of mathematical writing and speaking. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe it's about growing confidence around um, doing mathematics, especially for the lower level math courses. And then I work backwards from there. And so mm-hmm. that helps me figure out like what goes in the workbook, how do I structure the workbook to kind of like if they're, if it's a calculus course like we we don't have our pre-calculus course anymore we integrate it into calc one so we have a two mm-hmm. semester calculus with ah, pre-calculus sequence sort of a stretch kind of thing yeah yeah and that's uh so anyone who gets a lower score on the on our placement test goes into that um so we don't Got have any below that and so Great. so it's a lot of students who have had bad experiences with math before sure. and so that's what when I'm if I'm preparing that kind of a course I keep try to keep that in mind as well and try to think about how I can structure things right and right, like right. study skills and and mm-hmm. that kind of thing and so, so how yeah. does the grading come into that do you think yeah so then once I have um so I'll have um what I think I usually describe it as like the foundational content um, or like sure. the core content so mm-hmm. with mastery based testing I'll test like I'll come up with a list of objectives and it usually takes me a few iterations to get down to a small enough list mm-hmm. of like what's kind of what are the minimal skills that students need to get from this course mm-hmm. and then I think about um, where I want to kind of have them go deeper and so I have create what I've most recently been calling synthesis assignments where it's something a little bit more detailed so for example in calculus um when I last time I taught it was during like very in the midst of COVID and so I created uh, um, a uh, an assignment called flattening the curve and where they had to like interpret um, the COVID curve and what Mm -hmm. different how different um, things could have like what does it mean if the curve if the curve shifts to the right or to the left and that kind of thing sure 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 so more Very like um, yeah. yeah like quantitative more like, interpretive more uh, what do they call that sort of just um divergent formative kind of thing so there's yeah. not just one direction for them to go in 
Yep, exactly. So I, I think about what kind of assignments like that I might want to have. And mm -hmm. those I'll grade with um, specifications grading, typically. So it's like, um, and often I have them write, like, well, I, I always have them write full sentences. So that's one of the goals. So if they turn in mm -hmm. something where the math is correct, but it's just like a bunch of numbers, then mm -hmm. I'll say, okay, your math is correct. Now put it in sentences. And so, and that, so that'll be one of the specifications is that all mathematical expressions are part of complete sentences. And so, okay. um, so there'll be things like that. So is it correct? Is it sort of formatted correctly? That, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And they get mm -hmm. multiple mm -hmm. chances to, to turn that in, get feedback and, and revise it. Revise it. Okay. And so that means you don't have to make up a million assignments. And, you know, I guess if they get the math wrong, then maybe you would need a new assignment to be able to measure whether they can do the math or not. But for the specifications, I suppose they're, you know, yeah. once and they actually, go through the effort. Yeah, yeah. and actually even if it, for the math ones, I just have, it's the mm -hmm. same assignment that they just keep trying. Mm -hmm. um, or okay. if it's a proof, it's the same proof that they, they are revising until they get it correct. And so what that means is like, um, I actually do very, few assignments like if I compare if like if I'm teaching introduction for, to proof for example previously I would have had you know weekly problem sets with like several problems on them um, mm -hmm. and they turn it in get whatever score out of however many and then we move on right. to the next one and then there's some exams um, but now I try I make it really focused and so rather than giving them a problem set with a bunch of different problems um, I think about, okay, of these problems, which ones, which skills are the most important? And then I make a single question that kind of addresses that, that they can, that maybe is a little bit trickier, but they get multiple chances to revise it. Okay. And so overall, they're turning in fewer thing, fewer assignments, but they're turning them in multiple times and getting to a point where their final work is much, much cleaner. Much higher level. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And do you have anything summative so you can kind of see whether that has a good shelf life or how do you cope with that kind of a challenge? Yeah, it's a good question. That I don't do so much. One thing I mm -hmm. do do in a lot of my classes is have them do a portfolio. And so they mm -hmm. collect together their work for the semester and then reflect mm -hmm. on it. And so, um, oh, wow. so yeah. talk about like how did their uh, knowledge of this area um Evolve. grow over this over the semester how did their understanding of what mathematics is change and of their own um beliefs about mathematics that kind of thing mm -hmm. so um so um, yeah I don't really have I don't give a final the only well I use the final exam time as the final assessment so for any of the learning objectives if they haven't passed them by that point they can try again one last time on the final Okay. Which also, yeah, that also means that if they've passed everything by that point, they don't have to come to the final. So um, that's a nice reward. <laughs> yeah. And the synthesis projects are more of the, like, I guess they're not sort of completely, it's not like a final where I'm testing all these other, all these sure. things again, but they are pulling in ideas that they've seen over the course of the semester. Right. Because an argument in favor of a final exam is it, the studying for the final exam yeah. is when a lot of ideas all come together. But then what I'm hearing you say is, well, why does it have to be that? Why can't we have a different kind of an activity that pulls those strands together? Exactly. And the way I see it is um, if I have um, objectives that are, I'm testing in the assessments and they're trying them like they try an objective and they don't pass it, they try it again on the next assessment, that that also that uh, is um, it's like retrieval practice and interleaving. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. all those all those good things about um, that help them learn. So hopefully, having going through that cycle um, multiple right. times and finally getting to the correct answer um, that helps to strengthen the the sort of memory um, side right. of it. Build build those pathways in a really solid way. Exactly. Now I guess yeah. somebody might come back. Um, and say, well, okay, so they did a proof by induction, say, 
Yeah. And, you know, you got it perfect and, and they worked on it, but now they have to do another proof by induction, which is somehow different. Yeah. Like, how do you know that, that, that knowledge translates out of that specific example into a broader context? Yeah. Um, well, I suppose. Yeah. So what I would have is on the assessment, I'd have a, a reasonably straightforward um, induction and mm-hmm. then on, I might have a synthesis problem where it's a more complicated induction problem. And Got so, it. I mean, if they get the induction problem correct first time on the assessment, then, you know, they're probably pretty good with induction anyway. Mm-hmm. But, right. <laughs> but otherwise, they're going to try it several times. So they've seen several mm-hmm. different problems because the assessments are different problems every time. And then oh, they're okay. going to try the synthesis. And also we'll be doing in the workbook we'll be talking about induction in class. So we'll actually be having discussions about sure. how does induction work? A student will put up their answer. It'll be incorrect. We'll talk mm-hmm. about why it's incorrect and corrected in class. And so they're mm-hmm. also getting um, getting the content there. So it's sort of hitting in, in several different places. So I want to make sure that, I, and that I'm clear and that it's clear for the video that, um, yeah. that what you're saying is that the, in the synthesis, they're working and working and perfecting but on yeah. the assessments if they if they take another assessment on induction say it's a different induction exactly problem. yeah that's okay. a different one oh, yeah. okay okay i had misunderstood yeah. all right well that that's really solid um let me go back to my question so what yeah. decisions <laughs> did, did, did you so I, i'm still on question one though <laughs> um Maybe coming back to this alignment and and with purpose and practice. So yeah. you've got the, you know, what are you measuring? And so what kind of grading tools do you have experience using and in what context? Oh, yeah. So um, I pretty much always use the mastery-based testing with the assessments mm-hmm. um, and some kind of specific specifications grading with some assignments. I've started using ungrading. So if there are places where... Can you back up one second? So we've yeah. got the mastery base grading, which as I understand it, you know, you're proficient, you're super proficient, yep. you're on your way to proficient, you're aspirationally proficient, whatever. Um, so that I understand. The standards base, I'm not sure how that differs for me yeah, between well, the mastery base and the standards base. Yeah, I think... Well, or specification. Oh no, specification based. Yeah. That's, I'm yeah. sorry, I was confusing. I was confusing standards with specification. Yeah, and I it, okay. sometimes I have trouble with the terminology as well. Where does standards yes. based fit fit into all of this? So, right. um, but and also with the assessments, I grade them on. So for each outcome, it's either passed or not yet passed. So I don't okay. have any levels. Although actually, in calculus, there are some things that I require them to pass twice before they master it and then um so that makes that's sense been, yeah that was my language I don't know if I'd use the same language now but that was my language from a few years ago um okay, okay. yeah but mostly I just require them to pass it once and I don't give them any there's no sort of gradations of how close they were or anything like that okay you're either there or you're not there yeah exactly yeah, yeah. okay and then sorry the, and I interrupted you as you were going on past the <laughs> yeah <laughs> sorry that's um, specification too <laughs> Yeah, so if there's an assignment where, um, particularly if it's an assignment where the math needs to be correct, um, mm-hmm. but I also want them to be using full sentences and sort of writing things up more formally, then I'll use specifications grading and I'll mm-hmm. I'll lay out like this is what it needs to look like. Um, right, right. So that's going back to it's correct. There are full sentences. Your, mm-hmm. um, yeah, your explanation is complete enough. That kind of thing. Right. Um, sort of leaning towards that transparency, making sure that they know what you are looking for when you're yep. doing it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and also giving them practice um, seeing. So one thing I've done, I'm teaching um, real analysis right now. And for those, for I think almost all of my assignments where there's sort of this redoing, I built mm-hmm. in reflection as well. So then they're reflecting on mm-hmm. um Mm-hmm. They have to write about like what did they learn through doing this problem. Um, okay. And yeah. would they do that before or after you give the feedback? Before. Before. Okay. Yeah. And then you give them the feedback and then they redo it and then they reflect again. 
Yeah, that was my plan, but it turns out <laughs> I, set, I set it up so that it's hard for them to realize that they're supposed to reflect again. So I need to yeah. think the next time. But that was my plan is like they reflect every time. Right. Um, that way they could say, oh, when you said this, then I realized that, like that yeah. metacognition of, oh, this is what I corrected. This was yeah. where I went wrong. Yeah. Exactly. Articulating that is crucial. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now we know for assessments, we're doing mastery or standards based for these deeper dives. We're doing the, um, the, oh shoot, I've already lost the word, <laughs> specification <laughs> grading. And then yeah. you said you'd explored ungrading. Yeah, so I've started to use ungrading in places where it's not about things being correct, it's about making progress and getting feedback. And okay, so okay. I'm trying to think of an example of that. Um, I don't know if I have any in this class, but I think last semester I was teaching a sophomore seminar for math majors. Mm -hmm. where it's sort of introducing them to writing and speaking and mathematics and so and we okay. they learn LaTeX and um that kind of thing mm -hmm. and I'm um I mean could it be something like persisting in solving problems so it's not about that problem being right it's about yeah you know, struggling productive struggle or something like that yeah, actually, well, actually, no, I, I remembered what it is. I am using it this okay. semester. So <laughs> the, the LaTeX thing reminded me because um, I also have them in all my upper level classes. I have them use LaTeX and also an intro to proof it. Um, they're using oh, LaTeX. Overleaf has so, been a gift. To I process. love it. No? Oh, my goodness. It changes the whole game. Yeah, yeah. And um, so in analysis, they have the synthesis problems and they have the assessments. I only have six objectives that I test on the on the assessments and I call them fundamental proof techniques. So it's things like basically, can you prove, do an epsilon proof and sure. that kind of yeah. thing. Um, and then I have them do weekly writing. So mm -hmm. the weekly writing is um, of the problems that we discussed in class from the workbook so that we've got complete solutions. I take photos in class and I post the photos. Um, mm -hmm. And so I say, pick one of these three or whatever and type it up. And so they have the have the proof um, from class. And then it's a matter of typing it up and maybe making mm -hmm. some adjustments if they want to change the style or something like that. Great. So for those, if they turn it in, they get credit for it. And then I give them feedback. And so um, on their writing. And so that's, oh. that's ungrading. So as there's no partial credit, there's no, the, the only way they can not get credit is if they don't turn something in that week. And so, um, so that's where I've been using it. And how do you cope with the whole zeros thing? So if they don't turn it in, mm -hmm. is it that they need to turn in a certain number of them over the course of the right. semester? So there are a few freebies, basically. Is that yeah. Yeah, and actually, I think I set it up with no freebies. <laughs> like to get an A, you have to do all ten of them, and okay, and we're we've had nine so far, and everyone in the class has either eight or nine, except for I think one person has four, and um, he has his own things going on. Um, sure. So yeah, they've been pretty consistent, and I did a midterm course reflection with them, um, mm -hmm. just to check in and see how things were going, and. They said they really appreciated like the consistent feedback. So, so that's what I try to do is like I sit with each one, like go through and read each one, um, mm -hmm. highlight some places that they might want to rethink and then and give them some tips about, you know, your logic isn't quite correct here, or I right. see you use this command in LaTeX because I have them give me the link to their overly file as well. So I can go in and see their LaTeX and yeah. um yeah, so I just give your them. quotation marks are wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you use a line star instead of a line, you don't get all the all the equation numbers like that. Yeah, right, that kind right, of thing. Right. And so, oh, um, yeah. So, in terms of what you're grading, what I'm hearing, and I'm having a revelation now, they're uh -huh. doing a bunch of exercises before coming to class, which I can think of as their homework, right? Right. And then they're presenting and they're kind of correcting what they did. And then they're choosing one of those and they're latexing it, which presumably I, they can put in their portfolio. It yep, it goes in the portfolio. Yep. And then they are... Um, and then you are grading 
that week, what you're grading is that one, you're ungrading <laughs> that yeah. one um, problem that they typed up. So you're yeah. grading for everybody, but only one problem. And then if you're like me, maybe you have every other week a mini assessment. That's what I do. Uh -huh. um, but anyway, I mean, so it's one, but it's one problem. So yeah. for you, the amount of actual physical grading that you're doing, yeah. and I'm assuming you would have graded the homework yourself. Yeah. Sounds like it's less. I would, yeah, I would think so. Yeah. And it's, and it it's different. Like this is one of the benefits of alternative grading. It's a yeah. different feeling than if you're sitting there going, okay, this isn't right. How many points do I give it? Like, and yeah. if you, to, you don't have to make that assessment at all. It's more like... Uh -huh okay, this isn't is right. There? What what should I tell them? Like what piece should I focus on that's going to advance them, their writing for next time around? Right. And so what it's are they really, ready to hear? Yeah. 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 And I try to do the whole, um, give them something positive. <laughs> um, <and> then, <laughs> something, some improvement. <laughs> yeah. And try not to do too much. And this is what I learned from teaching our um, freshman, sophomore writing seminars is uh -huh. I, I use, I've started using I think it's called tag feedback and then it's okay. like tell them something um that you liked ask mm -hmm. a question and then give them a suggestion so that's the tag okay. and I don't necessarily stick with that structure but what it did teach me is like less is more basically like there's no yeah. I don't yeah. need to go through and correct all the commas or anything like that just right. read through it resist writing anything on it and then pick one, one or two things that I can that I can share Tag. with them for yeah. later, yeah, for next time, and just leave it at that. And that's sort of enough for them to be able to take in that right. feedback. Because um, you know they're going to be turning in something else the next week. So if there's something else, you can make a note to yourself, like make you know our yeah. next time. <laughs> make sure the other yeah I could seven thousand yeah. things <laughs> yeah because yeah, because you don't have to do it all in the first because it's a shock right when you receive all of that red yeah exactly that's too much yeah it's yeah. um yeah that just they'll just sort of shut down at that point and it won't be able to take in um the the suggestion so yeah so let me ask you um what's what, how are you coping with the temptation on their part to do to not do all the problems before class realizing that their <laughs> friends friends will maybe do some of them and then they yeah. can always since they're only turning in one they can turn in the one that they're that whoever presented in class that one yeah that's right, right. cuz it's the ones i choose like i just look back over the week and see what problems we did and then i pick like mm -hmm. two or three that seem to get most at the content that okay. is most important for the week. So it doesn't matter who presented them. I, I right. don't pay attention to that. But the right. um, presentations figure into their into their grade. So I see. to get, i um, trying to think of what, it, how, what my numbers are. I think it differs depending on the class size, sure. but um, this semester, I think they eat, to get an A, they would, or B, an A or a B, they would have had to present eight times in class. Okay. And so, um, so, okay, it means, so they have to feel some pressure. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And I think to, to pass the class, like, or to get a D, I think it was like, they have to present four times. So it is, they have to do something. Um, yeah. and, and that's also ungraded, I guess, now that I think about it, because it's like, whether it's right or wrong, you get a presentation point. And what I tell them is it's, giving them an opportunity to talk about math. So to get used to that, mm -hmm. to get used to standing mm -hmm. up at the board and, and do, talking yeah. about math. Um, and it also starts our discussion. And so, right. um, so they're kind of giving us um, their, their thoughts on the problem to kind of spark the discussion. And so even if it's wrong or particularly if it's wrong, it'll be a great discussion. And so I don't, I don't mind either way, whether it's right or wrong. I don't mind for some of the classes, um, we get to a point where the problems are tricky enough that they might only get a partial solution. And I tell them partial solutions are fine. Like that'll get us started as well. And right. so it's really just a matter of if you stand up in the front of the class and say some math, <laughs> you get a presentation <laughs> point. So right. 
Yeah, and right, I, and there's the social pressure. They don't want to stand up in front of their peers mm -hmm. and and not know what they're doing in general. Like most people don't want to put themselves in that position. Right. Yeah. So you're sort of relying on that. I've noticed I have my students do journals, and when I switched it from writing to me to writing to them. Uh -huh. So like introduce yourself, uh, write up your favorite proof, you know, th things like what you're, you're what you've been talking about. I even have them read the MAA um, instruction guidelines, uh -huh. <laughs> which is one thing and write about that, which is the cool. most popular journal they do. But once it became that they were writing it for each other and commenting on each other, mm. the level went way up. Like they yep. care much less about what we think about <laughs> them, true. even though we're us, we're the one taking the points and giving the points. Then yeah. they care about presenting knowledge, yeah. which is great. Yeah, and it, it's one of those things that I've been that I read about, which is it's the intrinsic motivation, yes, rather than exactly. the extrinsic. And have you seen that play out for in your classes? Yeah, I have. Yeah, um, my my favorite um assignment and I keep thinking like maybe there's a way for me to write an article or something about this but because mm -hmm. it was it just surprised me how well it worked but in differential equations um this was fall of last year I um so we were doing sort of predator prey equations and um we could have done like the SIR sort of um mm -hmm. you know uh pandemic kind of <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> modeling. and I yeah. thought well, we don't need more pandemic and so we yeah. I decided to do zombies instead you know based on Colin Adams zombies and yeah I've seen that yeah <laughs> yeah and so, so um so the way I set it up was and this was like my first real jump into ungrading in a, in a math course um mm -hmm. so they had to I put them in groups they had to write the start of a zombie story and then put it into a model that I had created for them in Mathematica. There were a couple of models that they could choose from. And then mm -hmm. based on the model, finish the story and then make a poster yeah. and then present <laughs> the poster to the class. And they got oh, so fun. into that. And the only, the way I graded it was, um, how did it work? You had to show up on the days when, because I, I allowed class time for them to work in groups on it. So we might've had like, sure two two or three days that we worked on it in class I can't remember so you had mm -hmm. to show up to class your group had to create a poster and some subset of your group had to present the story to the class and the poster there were specifications for the poster and if you did all that you got credit for it so it was like a just a, there yeah there was no partial credit it was like either you got it or you didn't and everyone got it because they were so right. excited to be like telling zombie stories and, yeah, <laughs> yeah it was just yeah. so much fun and I I was worried because I was like really hands-off like I it took a lot of setup in advance like I created a a um a beamer um poster template and oh, kind of right. pieces in for them and they had to have uh like a um a gradient field and they had to have some solution graphs and things like that so they had mm -hmm. to be some things that they'd created on Mathematica so I right. took a lot then but then I just kind of let them go and yeah okay. the, the excitement level was so high and the <laughs> results were also like and I had um, one student for example he's a math major and a creative writing minor and so oh I <laughs> He loved it. He was like, we were telling him he needs to just write a book, like, because he was trying to narrow down his story to fit it on the poster. <laughs> he just had so many ideas about how this whole zombie thing was going to go I down. Hope he, so, I hope he turned it in eventually into a paper that he turned in for one of his English classes. That would be awesome. That'd be yeah. great. <laughs> so yeah. fun. Yeah. So, but I mean, it, it sounds like, yeah, you are creating this intrinsic motivation by stepping away exactly and that and I wasn't I didn't completely believe it until I saw that how well that assignment worked that it really is yeah. you know give them something that um interests them and then just mm -hmm. yeah step back and see what they do with it and right. and it was really cool yeah and I think you've told me before but you have relatively small class sizes so yeah if, or in your implementations you don't have any experience with like a no, a hundred person calculus no. class or something like that. <laughs> okay. No, my biggest class, like I've 
that that differential equations was probably 12 students and I have 11 students this semester and so okay um yeah because I only teach one course right a semester right now because um, I'm the director of faculty development so I have some course releases so, yeah <laughs> how lucky they are to have you as director of faculty development that's <laughs> fantastic uh and you work with faculty from across disciplines yeah that's right yeah so I do I do a lot of different things like I run the new faculty orientation and mm -hmm. um so we have things in August and then I meet with them throughout the year I oversee our mentoring program um yeah I run workshops and just kind of oversee the faculty development calendar okay. so run book groups and that kind of thing so yeah okay I'm, I'm gonna circle back to that in one second because I wanted I wanted to make sure that I touch on one of the sort of fam next family of questions I think we've oh, yeah. already talked we, <laughs> we talked a lot about how did you start the journey and you're rethinking of grading but I think people are going to be very curious about um this idea of what are the advantages for the faculty it sounds like mm -hmm. there are some, some obvious advantages that we kind of covered that are yeah that you you spend less time grading and you're grading in a more meaningful way yeah. um would you say that you have more faith in the meaning of your grade or the efficiency mm -hmm. of the learning or can you talk to that a little bit yeah I think like sure, been... the meaning of the grade yeah mm -hmm. like I'm just thinking of a conversation I had with a colleague he was one of his advisees is in my class this semester and they were talking about registration for next semester and he was wondering like how was he doing and things and mm -hmm. um, so I was able to say, well, he can write an epsilon proof. He can do that. Like I could look at the objectives that he had passed and right. say, like, this is where he's at. And so I, it's really right. easy to communicate at any point, like what people know and what they don't know, which I think right. is great, good for me. And it's great for the students as well. They know also right. what, what they need to work right. on and what they're more comfortable with um, in a more concrete makes way. Sense. Yeah. yeah. And I think, um, one of the book early books that really influenced me was Joe Bowler's Mathematical Mindsets. Mm -hmm. And that was mm -hmm. the one that really got me thinking differently about how I teach my classes and how sure. to, I mean, building motivation, but also building students' confidence. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so in an authentic way, not just because yeah. Americans can be overconfident with yeah, absolutely right. no substance. But <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, can they actually um accurately say what they know and what they don't know um right. and also I think authentic mathematical tasks is another one of her th things so mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. another mm -hmm. thing I've thought about in doing like these synthesis assignments like what what are the really key skills that they need to take away from the course um and so yeah. a lot of what I try to focus on is like how are the students feeling like and one of my students in the the midterm course reflection this semester said um she's never I don't know if it was she but let me say she um mm -hmm. this is the first math course that she hasn't been stressed out in and so that to me is a victory like that, not right. that they're not doing any work like I feel like I'm actually asking them to do quite a lot um right but they know what they need to do to be successful and it's there's no there's nothing hidden it's it's transparent right. this is the word that's in the questions here it's um right so that's what I hope for is like we can get rid of all the anxiety around the math and just focus on having fun doing math and learning right. from that um right so, yeah so those moments where we're having an actual conversation in class and it's not right. just me telling them stuff those are like the best the best times in the semester what, that's what, I what hope could be for. better yeah 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 yeah, yeah. And it's it's creating that trust, mm -hmm. uh, yes. breaking down those barriers about the points and the you know this person is here to as as the the guardian of the knowledge <laughs> and, yeah. and I'm only going to be let through if I can can demonstrate all of it and yeah. instead this is my this is my guide my Sherpa my coach yeah my, right yeah. yeah and I try I to. I try to convey that when I, so when I give them comments, we use Canvas and so mm -hmm. they submit everything yeah. on there. And um, I've kind of switched just because, I, I mean, I used to write comments on my iPad directly on their work, but the mm -hmm. Canvas, Canvas doesn't always preserve those correctly. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, been there. Much, yeah. <laughs> and so what I've switched to now is highlighting in different colors mm -hmm. 
I don't use mm-hmm. red. <laughs> no. So and so I um so I say you know like in the green highlighted right. part, blah 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 blah. Um oh, but I also yeah. try to so I just put it in the comments of the mm-hmm. in speed grader. And then I sure. also do things like I use their name every time. So it's like Kate, oh. I thought you did this part really, really well, or like that kind of thing. Oh, so I always start yeah. with their name, so to try to make it yeah. personalized, um, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. try to pull in little things that, uh, like, if I know they were nervous about their first presentation, they did it, and I'm like, "Here's your first presentation point. I'm so grateful that you were able to stand up and and right. do you present that problem today, or thank you so much, or like, and try to put in little yeah. things like that, um, just to." Right make it seem like you know we're more of a team um right and no, I know who they so are <laughs> and, and <laughs> right yeah. hey good job yeah, yeah no I exactly. think those things really count for a lot for students especially first generation students students mm-hmm. who might authentically feel that I'm not the first person who's going to be on their side mm-hmm. just by by their through their experience and and who I present as you know before yeah. I've opened my mouth you know, understanding that some of us have some work to do to build that trust. It's not going to be automatic. We have to earn it. Yeah, Um, sure. That's really important. I want to come back to that pin because our last comment questions are sort of about department or community change. Um, And, you know, I'm really curious about faculty development because for a very long time, I felt like it's ineffective because it's like, oh, there's an English teacher and there's a history teacher and there's uh-huh. a mathematician. And it's very hard to do something uh, that all of those people feel engaged in. But I'm wondering mm-hmm. if grading yeah. gives some a conversation that people can talk about how they formulate their class. Has that been your experience at all? Yeah, for sure. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah. So I like last spring we had an ungrading book group. Um, so we mm-hmm. read the ungrading book, and we actually had uh, normally a budget for like a dozen people, and we had like twenty people sign up. So we had to have two separate groups, and okay. people were so excited. And that was people from across the college. A variety mm-hmm. of of um, of uh, departments were represented, and mm-hmm. um, and also a variety of ranks. So we had tenure track oh. through um through tenure more senior faculty and um Great. yeah it was just a lot of excitement about the possibilities of this and mm-hmm. people were sort of we talked about being like the grading revolutionaries or something like we were thinking <laughs> what if we just ungraded our whole first year sophomore seminar series like I think that would be mm-hmm. perfect and we're actually yeah. revising it right now um, because we're going from a three course series uh, sequence to a two course sequence and um, okay. I have this plan to try to, I don't know if we could get at this point the faculty to all be on board with ungrading because that, uh-huh. that would probably have to go through a faculty vote. Um, so I think we're yeah. too early for that. But okay. I think we absolutely have people who would be willing to ungrade in the new right. sequence. And if we could put, like I'm thinking, put together a skeleton course on Canvas to show how it works and provide all the supports so that it's easy for people to step into it and right. kind of see how it works and then go from there. So they don't have to invent it. They just have, they can see how how it could work for them and um, and have some support through it. So that's my goal is if we can do that with enough people at the start and then kind of build it up Mm -hmm. then we could see that go through that sequence. And the great thing about that sequence is, well, teaching in that sequence taught me how to teach about writing and speaking. And then that Mm. led to things like the zombie project. That's not something I would have done before if I hadn't thought about um, writing (laughs) writing and speaking into into math classes. And so my hope is if we start doing the ungrading there and start thinking about Mm -hmm. other ways to grade, it'll sort of permeate the whole curriculum. So that's my it's my evil plans. <laughs> I love I love that evil plan. And I also love that it circles back to where we started, right? That uh-huh. you want to make it easy for people to enter into this journey mm-hmm. by creating yeah. a sort of template for them to do it in a course that is maybe less threatening. Like yes. a, a freshman seminar is sort of about getting your feet wet, getting, you know, getting bonding, creating connections, making that transition into the college level. So 
it really makes a lot of sense. It's the place where you'd be least likely to meet resistance mm -hmm. on some. I'll, I wish people would rename ungrading because it's really not <laughs> ungrading. <laughs> yeah. It's, but yeah. It's, it's not about measuring, but it's, it's about measuring something different. But um, but anyway, I, I can see how that would be a nice fit. And then yeah. you can bring in all the other aspects and help them connect. Because I'd almost gone the other direction with with this and with uh, with professional development in general, development in general, where it it would be so valuable to do the opposite, which would be to take a bunch of people teaching a course. Mm -hmm. and do the professional development in connection to that course mm. like here you are you're all teaching pre-calculus this, this semester yeah. let's do this professional development around grading within the context of that course yeah because it's it's feeding that immediate need yeah. in some sense but I can also see or what you've opened my eyes to is the idea that just the concepts are something that are easy to talk across disciplines. Yeah, so, absolutely. I think so. Both. And I, yeah, and I think um, I guess a few things The so first of all, I think the first semester seminar, some people I know worry that it's going to be too different for students coming from high school, but I actually think oh. that's it it's an opportunity because you can say right. this is what college is like you can do whatever you like in the first semester they don't know what they don't know any better right so right um, yeah and so I think that's the perfect opportunity to introduce it and I think mm -hmm. that um one thing with alternative grading is that some people like I wasn't I wouldn't have been ready for it I think um mm -hmm. before going through the year of civil rights before reading Joe Bowler, before seeing Robert Talbot's stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I think it took me, I had to be in the right place to hear it and to be willing to try it. And so I think there are some people who are in that place and mm -hmm. others who just aren't there yet, but they could be if they see, right. if they get enough information, see enough success stories and that kind of thing. And so that's always been my philosophy is like, just put it out there. Some people will, it'll be like a snowball, like, right? And so right, right, that's right, what right. I've seen in my department is like when I started, um, like I was actually looking at, what was the question? Oh, what, what did I struggle with? Yeah. Uh, and for me, the first struggle was um, feeling like it was okay to do something different because it's like, well, this isn't how, you know, this we can't teach math that way. That's not how it's done. <laughs> and right. finally realizing like, um, I got to the point probably where I was like, I don't care. I have to do it differently. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it took a long time to give myself permission to do that. Sure, um, sure. And my department at the time was very conservative. And so I basically stealthily did things <laughs> without right, telling anyone. Right, right. And I, yeah. had, I had tenure. And so it didn't matter at that point. Um, mm -hmm. And so actually my when I started talking about it, it was less within my department and more outside of the department. And then sure. gradually people in my department heard about it and some people jumped <laughs> into it. So I have one colleague and he and I, like we, we uh, yeah. give each other Deep feedback in. on our systems. Yeah. Like before the start yeah. of each semester, he's like, how does this look? And, and we sort of, so right. he and I are both fully in on alternative grading. Um, but right. other people have kind of picked up little pieces. So I hear right. people talking about instead of having a problem set, just be turned in and that's it, letting students revise it. And so that's a mm -hmm. that's a step forward for our department. And so different people are doing different things. Some of us are all in, some of us are just doing little adjustments. But mm -hmm. I think it's having people think about, we've got to the point where people are thinking about things differently. So even if they don't right. completely change their their mindset is a little bit different and so right so it's been a it's taken like I don't know five six seven years to get to this point but that's yeah. it's fine like that's I think that's right. what you kind of have to expect is that it's going to take a while for unless unless it's a top-down thing where you just say right. okay here's it's here's this coordinated course here's how we're doing it now, but we don't do, right. we don't have coordinated. But you have to be through. ready for that too, right? I mean, you, even yeah. if you're a dictator, if you, if you say it's going to be like this and nobody follows you, what are you going to do? Right? Yeah. But what I love about what you're saying is there's so many parallels to how you teach and how you grade. 
because again, when you're grading those those um, uh, deeper dives, right? Um, the yeah. what you call them, but you're not you're not correcting everything. You're you're uh, telling them a few things enough that they're ready, what they're ready to hear, so exactly. they can progress, knowing that you're going to be there to help them on the next step. And it's the same yeah. with your colleagues. It may not be you to help them with their next step, but there'll be other people. And mm -hmm. I think with this project, what we're trying to get to is to create enough of a repository of people who can step yeah. in and help somebody if they're ready with what they're ready to hear at that time, right? Yeah, um, that's true. Yeah, and the, and so actually, I, one, I like that. an example of that is um, so I guess it turns out that so I've given several talks and run some workshops and things on alternative grading mm -hmm. in Allegheny, and uh, one of my um, younger colleagues. I guess she had been to those and incorporated stuff into her classes because then I heard her talking about her classes and I'm like, that sounds a lot like how I structure my classes. So <laughs> so she had like taken it all on. And yeah. then this semester, so last semester we had the book group. This semester we have we have teaching circles and usually it's mm -hmm. usually they're not like topic focused. It's just kind of an opportunity to come together um, every two weeks or something to talk about teaching issues. But right. we decided to do an alternative grading kind of alternative grading teaching circles so for anyone who's sure. at the point where they want to implement it's kind of a support group for them but oh, then I wow because it's every two weeks so they can kind yeah, of, yeah yeah but I was looking at my full semester thinking I don't think I have time to run this so I went <laughs> to my junior colleague and who's like super enthusiastic and is kind of like I guess I've been inadvertently training her <laughs> without not realizing it <laughs> And she's running oh, it, so she's like my, my, uh, yeah, she's kind right. of taking Protégé. the reins. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so it's been great that, uh, um, yeah. yeah, it's it's not. I think for a while it felt like it was all on me, and it's not. It's yeah. we have a, we have other people now that can, that are doing yeah. things and can talk about it and can guide other people. So, which means it's real, it's robust. You've changed yeah. culture, and that's that's I think the critical thing. And well, I think, so, yeah, well, I think no, this, no, please. yeah, I think some of it is, some of it is probably changed. Some of it is probably highlighting the commonalities that we had. So people were doing things mm -hmm. that were kind of along these lines, but we right. didn't have the common language. And so I think that's part yeah. of it as well. So not to take all yeah. the credit. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. People, no. Were doing, <laughs> people were doing this, but now we have, I think we have a pretty strong community of people who are, right. who are behind it. So no, that's great. Well, I really appreciate this. I mean, it was uh, much more than I could have expected out of the conversation, especially since we'd had a, like a mini one already. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but I think this was super valuable. Um, oh, great. I'm thinking, uh, so first I'm going to turn. So thank you very much, Rachel. I really enjoyed it. Okay. <laughs> 